Well, the story of the first Christmas over 2,000 years ago brings us a whole host of biblical characters that enthrall our imaginations, and they make us think to ourselves, what would it have been like to be there? Ever think that before? Ever celebrate Christmas and, and think to yourself, I wonder what it was like to be there and see everything, to stand with the shepherds in the field as they behold the angelic display, or to walk with Joseph and Mary as they journey to Bethlehem, or to encounter the wise men as they marveled at the infant Messiah. Most of all, we imagine what it must have been like to witness the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world, and to question what was Joseph experiencing as he considered what it would be to, to raise the son who was perfect, or what was going through Mary's mind, what was going on inside of her heart as she pondered the blessing of caring for the one who would save his people from their sins. All these things we ponder and think about, especially this time of year. But it is Mary who is of particular interest this morning. Mary who is idolized by some and mythologized by others. Mary is perhaps the most famous woman in Western history and for good reason. But who is she really? Roman Catholics worldwide lovingly refer to her as the Blessed Mother. Yet Protestants admittedly struggled to embrace her even as believers who convert from Roman Catholicism into what we would consider to be biblical Christianity, many experience a, a sense of loss, not at embracing saving faith in Jesus Christ or experiencing the comfort and grace of justification. I would argue that embracing biblical Christianity is, as the Apostle Paul would say, truly gain the gain of Christ himself. But many ex-Catholics feel like they've lost a connection to a person that they once held dear. They feel like they've lost Mary. Why do they feel like they've lost Mary? Well, because historically, Protestants tend to have a visceral aversion to all things Mary. Call it a Mary allergy, if you will, that makes us sort of squirm in our seats and virtually crawl out of our skin at the thought of revering her or honoring her. Why has there been such an oppositional attitude toward Mary through the years, certainly the last 500 years? Well, without question, it is because of the dangerous and even blasphemous doctrines that are taught about her through the years. In fact, if I could point to perhaps five of the greatest offenders, they would be as follows. Number one, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. The Immaculate Conception of Mary. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church asserts that when the angel Gabriel greeted Mary with hail favored one, favored one is full of grace, that he was declaring that she was wholly born by God's grace. In other words, sinless. In fact, Pope Pius IX proclaimed the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception preserved immune from all stain of original sin. However, nothing in Scripture teaches this. Furthermore, Romans 3.23 declares that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes Mary. And even Thomas Aquinas, who is arguably the greatest Roman Catholic scholar in history, he rejects the sinlessness of Mary. In fact, the Immaculate Conception of Mary was not formally adopted by the Roman Catholic Church until 1854. Which leads us to number two, the perpetual virginity of Mary. While the Bible makes clear that Mary was indeed a virgin when the Spirit conceived the Lord Jesus within her, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary was an ever-virgin, a perpetual virgin for her entire life. The church explains that, that Jesus' four brothers and multiple sisters, they explain that away by saying that they were born to a different Mary. All of this despite the fact that Matthew 125 says that Joseph kept Mary a virgin until she gave birth to Jesus, at which time they consummated their marriage and they had no less than six other natural children, four brothers named in scripture and at least two other daughters. Well, why is this perpetual virginity such a big deal? Well, for starters, it contradicts the plain teaching of scripture. 
But more importantly, because Catholicism sees the perpetual virginity as being evidence of her sinlessness, it thus qualifies her to manifest, quote, spiritual motherhood to all men whom indeed her son came to save, end quote. This leads us to the third error. Number three, the co-redemption of Mary. While it is not ultimate, the Catholic Church does assign Mary as a minor role in salvation. She is proclaimed as an intercessor of the church, quote, bringing us the gifts of eternal salvation. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix, end quote. Of course, several of these titles, according to John 14, 16, and John 16, 7, belong to the Holy Spirit. And furthermore, Jesus himself is called our advocate with the Father, 1 John 2, 1, as well as our mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5. Biblically, Mary has absolutely nothing to do with playing a part in our salvation. You won't find a single verse to support that. Number four, the bodily assumption of Mary. Because of the supposed sinlessness of Mary, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that after she died, Mary was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory, they say, and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, end quote. In this way, Mary is deemed to be the holy mother of the church, presently reigning alongside the Father and the Son and is mediating for us through prayer. In short, if you want to get to Jesus or to the Father, pray to Mary because she has his ear. This leads to one last error that I want to bring up, the veneration of Mary. Roman Catholic scholars distinguish between two key practices of latria and dulia. Latria is the Greek word for worship, while dulia is the word for service. And it's argued that when believers offer prayers or recite the rosary, or erect statues, or bow down to Mary, they're merely providing service or dulia. They see it as veneration and not worship. However, I tend to believe that for a large majority of Catholics around the world, the differences between the two are indistinguishable. In their heart, by their practice, they are worshiping Mary, even if it's not officially deemed to be so. Now again, when Roman Catholics come out of that system, they tend to reject such beliefs and practices. However, out of the fear of engaging in Mariolatry or the worship of Mary, they tend to reject her altogether. They develop, as I'm calling, a Mary allergy. Yet Mary was chosen by God to carry the Lord Jesus Christ. She birthed him, she nursed him, she raised him. Furthermore, she's featured prominently in the early chapters of Matthew and Luke. Frankly, to ignore Mary, to have a Mary allergy, is to reject the teaching of Scripture. But the question, I think, for us to consider and to ponder is, well, how are we to think about her? How are we to interact with her? How do we understand her? Well, there's no better place in the Bible than, I think, her own confession of faith and her confession of praise what is called by many as the Magnificat. And so turn over to Luke chapter 1 this morning. Luke chapter 1. There's a lot that takes place in Luke's gospel, certainly the first chapter. In chapter 1 of Luke, we have the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist, followed by the visit of the angel Gabriel to Mary which then motivates Mary to visit her cousin Elizabeth in verses 39 to 45. And actually, in Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 45, we read this, and this is going to kind of set the scene for us today. Verse 39, Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me, the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she 
who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And it's on the heels of that beautiful blessing that Mary utters her own prayer of praise. That's going to be the focus of our time today, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and he has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever." And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now, this beautiful prayer of praise and adoration is what's known as the Magnificat. And Magnificat, that word, is nothing more than the very first word in Latin of the translation of this prayer. And the first line is Magnificat anima mea dominum, which means my soul magnifies the Lord. So they simply took the first word of the prayer and called the whole prayer by that one word. And so magnificat in Latin, uh, mega lunea in Greek, is, it means to magnify. It means to extol or to praise or to exalt. And that is what Mary intends to do here once she apprehends the magnitude of what's going on. Mary is a, a young Jewish woman, likely in her mid-teens, who hails from the small town of Nazareth. By all rights, she was likely very poor and distinguishable from other Israelite women. However, we know that she is a woman of faith and piety and humility. The Lord chooses her to be the one to bear his incarnate God. And such a blessing it was that Gabriel refers to Mary as the favored one, literally to be filled with God's grace, blessed by the Lord to be his bond servant. And so it is in response to such a blessing that she utters this magnificat. A prayer itself is really simple. Scholars have noted that really there's four key parts to it. And what's interesting to note if you were to study out this prayer here is that there are at least 12 Old Testament citations within the prayer. Some are direct quotes, others are simply allusions. But here's the thing about this is that according to this prayer, Mary knows her Bible. She knows her Bible really well. And scholars have noted that there are similarities between Mary's prayer here and Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2. You could read those side by side and see parallel after parallel. So she had studied Hannah's song, and Hannah certainly was a a woman of faith. There can be no doubt. Mary was a woman of the word. And so we're going to examine these these different four parts here. We're going to see all this together, but number one, we're going to see Mary's praise for what God has done. Number one, Mary's praise for what God has done. Again, to repeat, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed." In the first two verses here, we see the parallel phrases, my soul exalts or magnifies the Lord. And then she says, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. And there are parallel statements, parallel elements here. We see that she both refers to her soul and her spirit, which is the inner heart life that she has. And then she declares that she exalts or magnifies. And then she says she rejoices in the Lord. And she calls him both her Lord and God my Savior. And so you see the parallel elements in both verses here. These statements are prevalent in Scripture. Just for example, Psalm 34, 2. My soul shall make its boast 
in the Lord, the humble shall hear and rejoice. Or Psalm 35, 9, my soul shall rejoice in the Lord, it shall exult in his salvation. Or Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with song and shall magnify him with thanksgiving. Or we could even consider how Hannah, the mother of Samuel, the prophet, begins her song. She begins it this way. My heart exalts in the Lord. I rejoice in your salvation. And so you see these reoccurring statements here. Mary is within the bounds of orthodoxy of Scripture. And she regards here this Mary's rejoicing. She says that she rejoices in, in God her Savior. And it has been noted here that if Mary was indeed a co-redeemer, or a a mediatrix, or sinless, she would not need a Savior. And so by declaring that she's crying out, God, my Savior, she humbles herself before her Savior. And that's exactly what we see in verse 48. She declares, he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave, literally servant or a, a female slave, maiden. For behold, from this time on, all generations are come me blessed. And so we see here Mary's humility and her lowliness. Even back in chapter 1, verse 38, Mary displays this humility when she declares, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. She submits herself. Some, some scholars have said, oh, when she says, may it be done, she's making a declaration. Oh, it may be done, like she has a will to assert over the Lord. But that's not at all what she's saying. She is submitting herself, Lord, may it be done according to whatever you want to do with me. I'm yours, O Lord. She understands her part in all this. She understands that her spot, her her part to play is service to God. She's a bond slave. And she notes that God regards her for her humble state. Certainly, it could refer to her earthly poverty, She was a a lowly person in terms of social status, but in truth it has more to do with her submission to God as a do-less, a handmaiden or female bondservant. Frankly, it would be inconsistent to send one who is gentle and humble at heart into the womb of a woman who would be proud. God wouldn't send his son into a, a boastful woman. No, God sends his son in lowliness and humility through the womb of a young virgin who is in a humble state. It's only fitting. And yet Mary doesn't dismiss the magnitude of this moment. Now, she certainly doesn't know all of what Jesus is going to do. She knew that she was giving birth to a divine savior. We know that from Matthew 1.21 because the angel tells them through Joseph, he says that, The child you're going to give birth to is going to be the savior of of his people. And so knowing all this, she declares, "For For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. And she was right. In terms of her sheer privilege, it's hard to find any other woman in the world who is this blessed as Mary. The one who who had the opportunity, the privilege, the blessing of caring for and serving the Lord Jesus Christ in such a unique way. It was Mary who would have tended his wounds when he was young and fallen and skinned his knee. It would have been Mary that would have nursed him and fed him and provided for his physical nourishment. It would have been Mary that would have read him scripture in the morning and talked to him all day long about the great things of God. I mean, she had such a special place in his life. And so she gives praise to God for what he is allowing her to do and for what he has done for her. And then we see number two, the declaration of God's attributes. The declaration of God's attributes, verses 49 and 50. She says, for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. In this next part of the prayer, Mary gives the reason for her praise. She praises the Lord for who he is, for his divine attributes, or as we like to call them in the theological world, his perfections. Verse 49, for the mighty one has done great things for me. 
The angel Gabriel told her way back in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And the miracle of this conception of Christ comes as a result of God's power, his power over her. And so therefore, she praises God as the mighty one. She calls him the mighty one. And the part of the prayer here that's reminiscent of Psalm 71, 19, where it's proclaimed, for your righteousness, O God, reach to the, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things, O God, who is like you? Mary could say the same thing. O Lord, you've done amazing, wonderful, mighty things. Who else could be like you? Mary praises God for his power and his might. And then she declares, in addition to that, and holy is his name. Holy is his name. Here, she praises God for his holiness. For his holiness. In doing so, she's acknowledging really three main things within regard to to the doctrine of holiness. She's identifying that God is perfectly pure in every way, that he is completely and wholly other, and that he is lofty and transcendent. That is the character and quality of God's holiness. And his name, his name signifying the totality of who he is, is holy. As Isaiah says, holy, 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 the earth is full of his glory, quoting the angelic realm. And then we read in verse 50, she quotes here, and his mercy is upon generation after generation to those who fear him. This is a quotation from Psalm 103.17, which is a psalm devoted to uh, praise. In the Hebrew, the word here is hesed, or loving kindness, but here the translator, so Luke actually uses the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, and this is rendered in our English as the word mercy, but the, there is supposed to be a connection. I think there's meant to be a connection between God's loving kindness his covenant love for his people, and the mercy demonstrated and shown to his people. And by sending his son into the world through the womb of Mary, God is extending mercy and loving kindness to those who fear him and love him with reverence. This promise isn't only for the people alive during Mary's time. This mercy, she says, is granted and given to generation after generation. Millennia of believers who fear the Lord and who trust in him for a salvation. In other words, she's also talking about all of us. Generation after generation of those who fear the Lord. And then we come to the third part of Mary's prayer, number three. God's righteous acts. Verses 51 to 53. We encounter what's interesting here, a series of reversals. Reversals. We can take note of actually three reversals, and I'll, I'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about here. Number one, the humbling of the proud in verse 51. Number two, the displacement of rulers in favor of the lowly, verse 52. And number three, the blessing of the poor over the rich, verse 53. And so one, two, three, we see three reversals. Now this is not to say that God is engaging in some sort of societal or cultural revolution. We know that the gospel doesn't produce this upending of all things culture. The Lord has never really operated like that. In fact, for the first three centuries of the church's history, they were under intense persecution. God never overthrew Rome for the sake of his church. But what we see here are three examples of of things that are meant to illustrate the kind of upheaval that will come by way of the arrival of Messiah. There's a a natural upheaval that happens certainly within individuals and will come to the end when he returns again. The song Joy to the World really could be sung as a millennial song, a, a praise and song of what will come in his kingdom. At the arrival of Messiah, he will not keep the status quo of perpetuating the wickedness of the proud or the tyrannical or the greedy. With regard to the gospel, the ground is leveled. In other words, no social or economic status really matters in the kingdom of God. Only faith in Messiah. To say that another way, it doesn't matter how much money you have when you come to Christ. It doesn't matter what kind of family you come from, what level of education, 
what ethnicity you have. It does not matter in this life how you come to Jesus. What matters is that you come to Jesus by faith, and that coming to Christ is what redeems you and places you into his kingdom. All other factors make no bearing on that at all. And so, similar to what is said in verse 49, Mary asserts in verse 51 that God has done mighty, mighty deeds with his arm. This word arm here is a common biblical anthropomorphism to refer to God's power and might. We know that God doesn't have a physical, literal arm, but when we say the arm of the Lord, it's his power, his strength, his might. For example, Deuteronomy 4.34, speaking of his deliverance of Israel from Egypt, it is said of the Lord, by his mighty hand and by his outstretched arm, he delivered his people. Again, abundant saving power. Then we see this first reversal here. He has scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. What's interesting here is that Mary, is she's speaking of God's future actions in the past tense. That he, he has done something or uh, he has already done something that's about to happen. And why did she phrase it this way? Well, because all of God's promises are so sure, it's as though they've already taken place in the past. But in the kingdom of God, he will scatter the proud. God is opposed to the proud, the Bible says, but he gives grace to the humble. We get that sentiment from Peter and from James that comes all the way back to Proverbs 3.34, that God scoffs at the scoffers and yet gives grace to the afflicted. Or Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, we, we learn about the Lord's abject hatred for pride. Yet Jesus goes on to teach that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3. And so that first great reversal is that all those who are proud will be humbled and thereby scattered. And then the second reversal in verse 52, he has brought down rulers from their thrones he has exalted those who were humble. This was a very common uh, Jewish uh, theme in Jewish literature and tradition, the idea of overthrowing oppressors. And that comes all the way back from the Exodus, Exodus uh, deliverance and the wilderness wandering. But in the kingdom, the Lord will bring down rulers from, his, from their thrones. It's interesting to note here when we consider Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 9.6 declares that a child will be born to us and the government will rest on his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And so the Lord himself at his second coming will bring down the wicked rulers, but as it expressed in the Beatitudes, the Lord will exalt those who are humble. And so, yes, there is coming a, a reckoning where God will remove all wicked rulers from their thrones. And there are times even now where he will do it. But the idea is that up is down in the kingdom. You could be the, the most powerful world ruler in human history and not have any greater claim to the kingdom of God than a person who's a pauper and has absolutely nothing, their hand and their, their face in the dust, coming to God by faith. There is no difference except for faith. Finally, number, number three, the last one. Verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things and he has sent away the rich empty-handed. The first half of this verse is found in places like Psalm 103 and Psalm 107. It's important to understand that this is not some sort of prosperity theology here. God is not a Aladdin's genie granting good things to poor people indiscriminately. The phrase, he has filled the hungry with good things, is an illustration of the goodness of God to bless his people. Again, the people who fear him. And that's the context of Psalm 103, 5, and Psalm 107, 9, and Psalm 146, 7. Verses like that. Furthermore, Jesus teaches this in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they shall be satisfied. And this is in contrast with the rich, the rich. Now again, Scripture does not oppose the possession of wealth. That's not the problem. You could be a rich person and have faith in Jesus and be saved, but it's those who are greedy and who spurn dependence on God, those he will send away empty-handed. And so many times when we see this phrase, the rich, it's sort of a, 
It's sort of a derogatory term toward those who act rich in terms of pride and arrogance, not the wealth and riches themselves. But God's people are those who are wholly and completely dependent on him. And so, yes, in that way, he will oppose the rich in spirit and the rich in pride. And he will grant good things to those who are hungry and thirsty for his righteousness. And this leads us now to the last stanza of Mary's Magnificat, number four, remembering God's mercy to Israel. Remembering God's mercy to Israel. Verses 54 and 55. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. He has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Now, this is really important. Otherwise, we miss the context of the entire passage. We have to remember that at this point in Israel's history, God had been silent for 400 years They had not heard a word from him. In fact, the last thing that they heard from the lips of God through the prophet Micah, or excuse me, Malachi, in Malachi 4, 6, he warns Israel of the threat of a curse if they don't turn back. And no sooner does he utter the word curse that God goes silent for four centuries. In fact, Elizabeth's son, John the Baptist, is the first prophet to come after Malachi But his ministry at this point is still 30 years away because he hasn't even been born yet. And so when angels begin appearing to Jews in Israel, they appear to Zacharias and Mary and Joseph, it's marking the beginning of a new era. People weren't used to being visited from angels and receiving divine revelation. And so Mary is understandably ecstatic that in sending his son into the world, God has given help to Israel, his servant. Again, all of this, she says, is in remembrance of his mercy. Because the temptation for Jews after 400 years of silence, and now they're under Roman occupation, they were under Greek occupation for a while, now they're under Rome. That's the, it's the fourth major kingdom that they've been under in terms of bondage. That doesn't even include Egypt. They're under the Babylonians, they're under the Persians, they're under the Greeks, now the Romans. The Romans were the the toughest. And so now they're under occupation here, or they're under under domain, and it's easy for Jews in that day to, to think to themselves, maybe God forgot about us. He hasn't talked to us in a while. He hasn't given us a prophet. We have no hope of a future. We're we're hanging on to Messiah, but who knows? There were no less than thirty alleged messiahs that people believe were coming into the world and they rose up and gathered gathered followers and they died and then there was all came to nothing and so what's going on has god forgotten his people verse 55 says that god had spoken to israel's fathers well who she says mary says to abraham but certainly she also includes by virtue of the fathers here isaac and jacob and joseph The Lord had spoken to so many promises to Israel. God had promised them he would preserve them. He promised that he would save them. He promised that they would be glorified, that the whole world would be blessed through them. He promised them a land and a posterity, descendants. And he promised them an everlasting king. But the question is, have you forgotten us, O Lord? It's been so long since we've heard from you. Are you coming back? To deliver us? It's easy for us even now to think that way. Lord, it's been 2,000 years. Have you forgotten about us? Far from it. Far from it. And during this season of silence, it's easy to think that God, in his silence, had forgotten his promises. But here's the thing. God never, never forgets. He spoke to the fathers, to Abraham, And to his descendants, not just then, but forever. Meaning that he intends to keep all of these things. And so Mary's prayer, her exaltation, her magnificat, this is a prayer of glorious proportions. Her her heart and her soul are bursting out of her chest. 
as she considers that God has not abandoned his people, when she considers that God is not far away, that he is keeping his promises, and then certainly her heart would have been overflowing with joy and praise and exaltation when she considers the fact that not only is God keeping his promises, but God is going to keep his promise to send his son through me, through my womb. Who am I, right? Nobody would think they were worthy of receiving the Lord in such a way. But yet that is the special blessing that Mary received from God. Mary, who was a humble bondservant of God, a woman of prayer, piety, knowledge of the scriptures, devotion to God, faithfulness, adoration, a godly woman. Verse 56, Mary stayed with her cousin Elizabeth for about three months, and then she returned home. Before too long, Elizabeth would give birth to John the Baptist, who would be the forerunner of the Messiah. But within a few more months, Mary herself would behold with her own eyes the fulfillment of God's promise to her. I have no doubt she would have repeated this song over and over and over again in her heart. And even at the birth of Jesus, the Bible says Mary would treasure all these things, pondering them in her heart. There was a special place in her heart, a special devotion, a special relationship that she felt connected to the Lord because of what he'd done for her. And as she pondered the power and the mercy and the holiness of the Lord, her soul rejoiced greatly in him. What a marvelous sister in the Lord that we have. What a marvelous example of faith. What a wonderful servant of God, our beloved Sister, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, you teach us very clearly that we are to worship no one except God alone, that Jesus Christ is the only one who is worthy of our praise and adoration and worship. And yet the Bible tells us over and over again, O oh Lord, that you, you give us the charge of honoring those to whom honor is due to be grateful for those who have spoken the words of truth to us and have acted as examples in the faith. We think about all those saints that you give to us in Hebrews 11, for example. The saints who've gone before us and great forerunners of the faith who, who point us back to Christ. And Lord, we are not to exalt any man or any woman above you, O oh Lord. We are not to exalt ourselves, certainly. We are meant to exalt only you. And yet, Lord, we do thank you for how you've given servants and given gifts to the church, teachers and prophets and those who you've used in service. And certainly we're grateful to you, O Lord, for our dear sister Mary, who received the blessing of carrying you, O Lord Jesus, in her womb and nurturing you. You gave her a special blessing, O Lord, and what a wonderful blessing it is. But most of all, we are grateful and we exalt ourselves in prayer to worship and serve you alone. You are worthy to be praised. And so, O oh Lord, let us join in this exaltation that we might declare that our soul magnifies the Lord. We rejoice in God, our Savior. And let that be the blessed song of our hearts, even now as we consider all these things around this season of Christmas. Lord, let our hearts be pure and right and wholly devoted to you and holding all things in the right accord. And let us regard all things with truth and spiritually, Lord. We thank you for what you've done and what you continue to do. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.